trust all is well with you. Amen. So I just want to, what you call it, uh, remind you again and give a quick announcement again that next week we're going to celebrate our 22nd anniversary with Pastor Dave McTaggart. And I'm looking forward for, you know, to having you and to see you. Uh, all of you come and bring your friends. If you have one friend or two friends, just bring over. We're going to celebrate God's goodness for this church. And um, I just want to share a little bit here that um, since we move in here, I feel that um, God wants uh, to bring us to see and remember the goodness of God. If you sense that. The moment that we move here, even before we move, and then we, we've been here for uh, almost two months now. And the message that I've been sharing about the goodness of God, God's goodness, is to remind us that God is good. Beside all the things that is happening in your life, God is good and He is faithful. And as, as I worship together with the music team, it's also blessed me personally that song, The Goodness of God. I will sing The Goodness of God. And I want to encourage you to keep on singing The Goodness of God. Not complaints. Not questioning the Lord all the time. But let it be praises and worship. Saying that, God, you are good, you are faithful. All my life, you have been faithful. And you will always be. So I just want to encourage you on that one. Okay? And um, today, I want to continue from what I've been preaching from the story of Naaman. And I want to close with this. So three weeks ago, I preached about Naaman, the broken warrior. And last week, I preached about the unnamed girl. She had a wish for her master, Naaman to get healed. From her story, from this unnamed girl, we could learn how, how to see hope in a hopeless situation, how to see goodness instead of evil, how to love others unconditionally, how to live as a light in the darkness. That's what I preached last week from this unnamed girl. And today I want to continue on this uh, Naaman story on what happened next after he got healed. Okay, this is very interesting. There's one character in the Bible. His name is Gehazi. And if you look at your Bible, some versions showing the title of that passage. It says, Gehazi was the greedy servant. The greedy servant. Now, let's start with this because I have a lot to share from this message. And I want you to... Uh, Feel free to take notes because there's a lot of messages that we can learn from this story. Okay, Second Kings chapter five, verse fourteen to twenty-seven. <clears throat> Second Kings chapter five, verse fourteen to twenty-seven. I'm gonna read it from New Living Translation. So Naaman went down to the Jordan River and dipped himself seven times. You know this story, right? I preached three weeks ago, and I don't, uh, don't want to mention again uh, due to the time. Okay. As the man of God has instructed him. And his skin became as healthy as the skin of a young child. And he was healed. So Naaman was healed seven time, after seven times uh, dipping himself in the Jordan River. Verse 15. Then Naaman and his entire party went back to find the man of God. They stood before him and Naaman said, Now I know that there is no God in all the world except in Israel. So please accept a gift from your servant. But Elisha replied, As surely as the Lord lives, whom I serve, I will not accept any gifts. Okay, I mentioned about this. Naaman bring the best gift, I guess. <laughs> A lot. But Elisha said, I will not accept any gift. And though Naaman urged him to take the gift, Elisha refused. Okay, Elisha refused. Then Naaman said, all right, but please allow me to load two of my mules with earth from this place, and I will take it back home with me. From now on, I will never again offer burnt offering or sacrifice to any other God except the Lord. However, may the Lord pardon me in this one thing. When my master, the king, goes into the temple of the God Rimon to worship there and, and lands uh, on my arms, may the Lord pardon me when I bow too. 
Go in peace, Allah says. So Naama started home again. So it was done. Naaman healed, he went home. Now let's go to the con- uh, to the next one here. Now this is what I want to preach on. Okay, verse twenty. But Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, the man of God, said to himself, "My master should not have let this Armenian get away without accepting any of his gifts." As surely as the Lord lives, I will chase after him and get something from him. So Gehazi set off after Naaman. When Naaman saw Gehazi running after him, he climbed down from his chariot and went to meet him. Is everything all right? Naaman asked. Yes, Gehazi said, but my master has sent me to tell you that two young prophets from the hill country of Ephraim have just arrived. He would like 75 pounds of silver and two sets of clothing to give to them. By all means, take twice as much silver, Naaman insisted. He gave him two sets of clothing, tied up the money in two bags, and sent two of his servants to carry the gift for Gehazi. But when they arrived at the citadel, Gehazi took the gift from the servant and sent the man back. Then he went and hid the gift inside the house. When he went to his master, Elisha asked him, Where have you been, Gazi? I haven't been anywhere, he replied. But Elisha asked him, Don't you realize that I was there in spirit when Naaman stepped down from his chariots to meet you? In this the time to receive money and clothing, olive groves and vineyards, sheep and cattle and male and female servant. Because you have done this, you and your descendants will suffer from Naaman's leprosy forever. When Gehazi left the room, he was covered with leprosy. His skin was as white as snow. Wow, it's a powerful story. It's a powerful story. Now, let me start with this, okay? I'm I'm, going to share a lot here, a lot of messages I want to share from this story. Who was Gehazi? He was a servant of the prophet Elisha. He was Elisha's personal uh, associate, okay? So he saw many miracles take place with Elisha. He witnessed a childless woman and her old husband have a child in, in the last chapter, in 2 Kings chapter 4. He also saw another miracles in 2 Kings chapter 4. A poisonous soup be purified and made safe to eat for everyone. So he saw all these things. He was very fortunate to have witnessed with his own eyes things that no one can do without God. However, there was something wrong with his heart. Greed. There's a greed in his heart. He enjoyed a position of power, but was ultimately corrupt, misusing his authority to cheat Naaman. Now, let's see what's happened here. Okay? I'm going to show it to you verse by verse here. Let's go verse 20 to verse 23. But Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, the man of God, said to himself, My master should not let this Armenian get away without accepting any of his gift. As surely as the Lord live, I will chase after him and get something from him. What can greediness make us into? I'm going to give you two things here. What can greediness, is it the right word to say? Greediness, right? How can greediness, uh, what can greediness make us into? Number one, a liar. Okay, a liar. Because of Gehazi greediness, he lied to Naaman by using Elisha's name. And made up a story in order for him to get this gift. Naaman say. In verse 21, continue here. So Gehazi set off after Naaman. When Naaman saw Gehazi running after him, he climbed up down from his chariot and went to meet him. Is everything all right, Naaman? You chased after me. You came to me. Is everything all right? I'm, I'm heading home. And then Gehazi says this. Yes, but my master has sent me. Elisha didn't send him. Okay. And then not only that, he made up a story. To tell you that two young prophets from the hill country of Ephraim have just arrived. He would like 75 pounds and so on and so on. 
He didn't say that. Elijah didn't say this. So what can greediness make in us into a liar? You can, you can be called as Christian, but how many of us still lie using other people's name in order for us to get what we want? Maybe not here. <laughs> Maybe somewhere else. But there are so many Christians, they call their Christian, but they still lie using God's name. Using their pastor's name <laughs> in order to get what they want. Using other people's name to get what they want. You know, the ninth commandment that God gave to Moses and to the people of Israel is this. Exodus chapter 20, verse 16, from the Message Bible. I like from the Message Bible here. Exodus 20, verse 16. We're focusing on don't steal, there's no other God, don't lie, don't murder, don't commit adultery. But number nine, it says this. Exodus 20, verse 16, from Message Bible. No lies about your neighbor. Don't use other people's name to get what you want. Elisha didn't say all these things, but Gehazi used Elisha his master name, and made up story to get what he want. Lying is a trap. The moment you lie, it will bring you to another lies. Matthew chapter 5 verse 37 says this, Just say a simple yes, I will, no, I won't. Anything beyond this is from the evil one. That's Matthew chapter 5 verse 37. If it's yes, yes, no, no, and besides, anything beyond this is from the evil one. So lying is a trap. The, mo the moment we start one lie, there's going to be the second lie. There's going to be third lie. And it's like a trap. John chapter 8, verse 43 to 44. John chapter 8, verse 43 to 44. Why can't you understand what I'm saying? This is what Jesus said. It's because you can't even hear me. For you are the children of your father, the devil, and you love to do the evil things he does. He was a murderer from the beginning. He was always hate the truth because there's no truth in him. Now read this carefully. When he lies, it is consistent with his character. For he is a liar and the father of lies. So the devil is the father of lies and is consistent with his character. So lying is the character of the devil. When someone lies, the character of the devil is in him. Regardless, they call themselves Christian. Are you with me? It's very easy. People say, I'm Christian, I'm Christian. But when he lies, well, that's the character of the devil. Because lying is consistent with the devil's character. There's no what lying. Some people say it's white lying, it's black lying, it's gray lying. doesn't matter. Lying is lying. So when someone's lie, the character of the devil is in him because the devil is a liar and the father of lies. But Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is the truth. Whatever he says is the truth. There's no lie in Jesus, in our God. So the devil is a liar. He's the father of lies. He steals, he destroys, and he kills. So, church, everyone, including myself, let's guard our heart not to lie in order for us to get what we want. And it's very easy, not only we lying, but we're using other people's case, name, in order for us to get what we want. That's the message I want to give it to you. That's number one, okay? So don't use God's name or misuse your authority in God to cheat other people in order to get what you want. Now, let's see carefully here. I want you to see this. I want to give two comparisons on these two things. Gehazi said to himself in verse 20, this is verse 20, it says this, But Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, the man of God, said to himself in verse 20, My master should not have let this Armenian get away without accepting any of his gift. <coughs> as surely as the Lord lives, I will chase after him and get something from him. Now, if you look at there in verse 20, 
Can you see verse 20, please? Yeah. Second Kings verse five, uh, chapter 5. Second Kings chapter 5, verse 20. It says, as surely as the Lord live, I will chase after him and get something from him. So in his mind, he's saying that. As surely as the Lord lives. Now, let's go back a little bit. Verse 16. What Elisha said. Let's see what Elisha said to Naaman when Naaman offered to Elisha the gift. Gehazi said the same thing to what Elisha said to Naaman. Verse 16. But Elisha replied to Naaman, As surely as the Lord lives, whom I serve, I will not accept any gift. So can you see here? The master and the servant saying the same thing, As surely as the Lord lives, but Elisha said, I will not accept. But the other one said, As surely as the Lord lives, I will chase him. So it's very easy for someone, because of his greed, because the greediness in his heart, he can use any names, even God's name, to get what they want. So be careful with that. Don't misuse God's name. As surely as God lives, then he lied. Wow, that's dangerous. And I don't want the church to have that kind of character. Number two. Number one, what can greediness make someone into a liar? And number two, a calculative person. In Indonesia, we call it itungan. <laughs> a calculative person. Gehazi was being calculative to, to Naaman. He didn't feel happy that Naaman could walk away freely without giving something. He couldn't see when someone else got something free from his master. He wanted Naaman to pay something on what he got it for, for free from his master. Maybe, maybe even 10 cents less. <laughs> he could not make Na Gehazi sleep again. So Gehazi just won the gift from, from, from Naaman. Gehazi just wanted to have the gift on something that he didn't do. Elisha was the one who dealt with Naaman, but Gehazi said, I want that gift. He thought we deserve to have this gift. If my master don't want it, I want it. I want to get it. I don't want to lose this chance. Now, what the Bible say about being calculative? Now, this is very interesting. This is very interesting. What the Bible says about being calculative. Matthew chapter 10, verse 8. Matthew chapter 10, verse 8. It says this. Heal the sick. Raise the dead. Curse those with leprosy. And cast out demons. Give as freely as you have received. Give as freely as you have received. Freely you have received, freely you give. Now, I want to bring to the context here. The context here, when you are proclaiming, the context here, the book of Matthew chapter 10, is talking about Jesus sent the disciples to go for the, doing the ministry. But when you do ministry, give as freely as you have received. So, the context here, when you're proclaiming God's kingdom, when you do your ministry for God and for the people, heal the sick, raise the dead, cast the demon, do it freely. Don't do it for money or fame. I'm not saying that when we, we invite someone or guest speaker coming preaching here and then we don't give love, give, I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is this. Whatever you do for the Lord, don't have a motivation for money behind it. When the church, when you got invited to someone else or doing ministry and then they want to bless you, receive it with blessing. I thank you, God. But don't do it because of I want money. My parents has been taught me this since I was young. Even when, when I was called to be a pastor when I was 18 years old. My parents always said to me, whatever you do when you preach here on the pulpit, don't ever 
bring your heart for the, because of the money. Money can become your master. So, either you manage money, either you control money, or money controls you. Okay? So, as we have received from God freely the blessing, salvation, His grace, then we should give freely to other people too. So Naaman got healed. He's talking about healing here. He brought the gift. But Gehazi saying this, I will not let him go just like that. He needs to pay something for it. Wow. <laughs> That's what I call being calculative person. Even one cent or ten cent, I will get it from him. He's not worthy. He's not deserved to get this for free. <laughs> So when I'm preparing this part, this message, I was reminded with one character in the, New in the New Testament that has the same attitude. He was Judas Iscariot. One of the 12 uh, Jesus disciples, he was the treasurer in Jesus' ministry team. <laughs> he was the one who betrayed Jesus at the end. Now, let's see this. This is very interesting. It's the same attitude, same character. John chapter 12, verse 1 to 6. Okay, John chapter 12, verse 1 to 6. Six days before the Passover celebration began, Jesus arrived in Bethany, the home of Lazarus, the man he had raised from the dead. A dinner was prepared in Jesus' honor. Martha served, and Lazarus was among those who ate with him. Then Mary took a 12-ounce jar of expensive perfume made from essence of nard, and she anointed Jesus' feet with it, wiping his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance. But Judas Iscariot, the disciple who would soon betray him, said that perfume was worth of a year's wages. It should not have been sold and the money given to the poor. That's an excuse. Verse 6. Not that he cared for the poor. He was a thief. And since he was in charge of the disciples' money, he often stole some for himself. Wow, he's very clearly saying this. You know who wrote this? John. Even his own mate. Notice, my body stole our money. We give all my money to this ministry, but I know him. That's why John wrote this. He was a thief. And since he was in charge, so I would say that Jesus' ministry was powerful that has a treasurer in the team. And Judas was in charge. And he says what? He often stole some money. Stole God's money. Not this. He was one of the disciples of Jesus. Gehazi was the servant of Elisha. So when someone said, I'm Christian, if they can steal something else from someone else, it happens in this world. That's why I don't use this title name. I'm Christian. I love God. I use God's name. Use this people's name. But it's all about our greed. So it's, it's, it says here that Judas often stole some for himself. And Gehazi took the gift and hid it in the house. Same thing. And and I want you to, to look at this. Don't you notice that Gehazi had double from Naaman? That's in verse 23. 2 Kings chapter 5, verse 23. By all means, Naaman says this, take twice. Can you see that Naaman was a giver, but Gehazi was a greedy servant? 
Gehasi asked this much, and Naaman said, I give you twice. Wow. <laughs> Can you see on Gehazi? He thought, like, yes, I made it. <laughs> I got double. <laughs> wow. That's a trap. By the devil. And and I wanna what you call it when 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 I am preparing this message, I was asking myself what factor that made Gehazi became a greedy servant. Now this is very interesting. I want to show it to you. He's been living together with Elisha, his master, but why there's a this greediness inside of him. What factor? His surroundings. What do you mean, Pastor? I'm going to bring it to you in a deeper way here. What I mean with his surroundings is not on Elisha, but to whom Elisha and Gehazi was ministering most of the time with. I'm going to reveal it to you here, okay? And because of that surrounding, Satan used those surroundings to tempt Gehazi. Now, there are three things here, three factors that, um, what you call it, uh, uh, tempt Gehazi to fall into this greediness trap. Number one, 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 8. Let's go back one chapter before, okay? His surrounding is um, uh, to whom Elisha and Gehazi was ministering most of the time with. Okay, number one is this. This is the factor. Second Kings chapter four verse eight. One day Elisha went to the town of Shunem. A wealthy woman lived there, and she urged him to come to her home for a meal. And use, if you look at the whole story, this is the, the woman that Elisha uh, prayed that she, she got pregnant, she got a, a kid. But if you look at here, it says what? A wealthy woman. Wealthy woman. Okay, that's number one. The wealthy woman from Shunem. Number two, Second Kings chapter 4, verse 38. 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 38. Number 2, the group of prophets. Elisha now returned to Gilgal, and there was a famine in the land. One day as the group of prophets were, were seated before him, he said to his servant, put a large pot on the fire and make some stew for the rest of the group. So the group of prophets, that's number 2. And number 3, you know this story, the well-respected commander Naaman, you know, a famous commander. Now, his surrounding that made him get tempted for his greediness. He spent time ministering with Elisha with this top high class level of people. Wealthy women from Sunem, group of prophets, and the great commander of Naaman who are willing to give that much. Are you with me here? So be careful with your surrounding. Some, some people utilize this chance to get what they want for themselves by getting close or lobbying with the wealthy, uh, with the anointed God's prophet, with the famous one, with the top high class people in order to get what they want for themselves. Do you understand what I'm saying? Sometimes we just ignore the lower mid-class people and then we thought, let's get close with the top one because we want to get what we want to get. The wealthy one. Be careful with that. Why? Because sins, just right there, will bring you down because of your greediness, your wrong motivation. We not choose people, oh, I want to spend with this... Uh, time with only this group of people is don't we are God's church we love people unconditionally so pastor is it wrong that we have a, a top class people it's not 
It's not wrong with that. It's the matter of your heart. If you have a behind that, a wrong motivation to get what you want, to get close with him in order to get what you want, then that's wrong. But to, to have friends with the top class people is fine. You can bring a good influence and they can bring a good influence for us and we can learn something from them why they become successful. So see the positive things. But the moment you have a wrong motivation in your heart while you approach this group of people, be careful with that. So are you with me? That Gehazi spent time ministering with Elisha with the wealthy women from Sunam, the group of prophets, and the great well respected commander who get all of this gift and because of that Gehazi thought I want to get whatever they have whatever they offer greediness always say never enough to self and careless for others I repeat again greediness always say never enough to self and careless for others it always focus on, on self-satisfaction, which never be satisfied. Okay? Never be satisfied. That's greed. Some people have an excuse. They are saying that greediness, same as being smart. You need to be smart, Pastor. We need to be smart. Hey, um, it's just like a tin of line. <laughs> you can call it smart, but God look at your heart. Is it greed? What is it? Being smart is knowing when to stop. Greediness is not knowing when to stop. <laughs> Greediness never, is never enough to self. Either money controls you or you control your money. Now, um, one of the TV shows that I like to watch when I was young was this. Can you show the image, please? Deal or no deal? You know that one? Oh, I love that show. <laughs> deal or no deal? I love this show. We could see why I like this because it's very what you call it uh, uh, tense. When when someone you need to choose either deal or no deal. So we could see how people can be wise with their decision on money. Do you want more or enough? <laughs> can you see that? Like it's very. Uh, I love this show. Like, yes, continue, deal or no deal. You want some more or this is enough. You, you know, like, like most of the time when we watch this TV show, we always say, just say yes, just press yes, yes, just press yes. And then, you know, the, the players say like, uh, I want to go next, I want to go next, I want to go next, I want to go more, I want to go more. So this, this is very interesting. So we could see how people can be tempted when there's something valuable talking about money numbers here okay so be careful guard your heart Luke chapter 12 verse 15 Luke chapter 12 verse 15 then Jesus said beware what he says guard against every kind of greed Jesus said this not me saying this I repeat again Beware, God against every kind of greed. Life is not measured by how much you own. Jesus said this himself for us. Proverbs 15 verse 27. Proverbs 15 verse 27. Greed brings grief to the whole family. But those who had bribes, we live. Proverbs 28, verse 25. Proverbs 28, verse 25. Greed causes fighting. Trusting the Lord leads to prosperity. So be careful with that greed. Maybe you think that, no, it's nothing. This is what I want. I have what I want. I have money I can buy. But being smart, being wise means know when to stop. I think I have enough. That's wise. That's why I call wisdom. I think it's enough. Know when to stop. I think I have enough. Greed is always say never enough to self. Okay? Okay, let's continue. 
Now, I want to close with this. As I mentioned, I preach this verse by verse. 2 Kings chapter 5, verse 25, 26. 2 Kings chapter 5, verse 25 to 26. So when he went to his master after the Gehazi uh, hid all this gift in the house, so he went to his master, Elisha asked him, where have you been? Where have you been, Gehazi? I've been anywhere, he replied. But Elisha asked him, don't you realize that I was there in spirit? When Naaman stepped down from his chariots to meet you. Is this the time to receive money and clothing? And so on and so on. So in verse 26, listen to this carefully, Gehazi lied again. Not to Naaman, but this time to Elisha. Where have you been? I didn't go anywhere. As I mentioned to you, when someone lies, it's like a trap. One lie leads to another lie. That's why the Bible says, if yes, say yes, no, say no. Anything beyond it comes from the evil one. Small lie. There's no such small or big lie. White lie. So lie is lying and it will lead another lie. Can you see here? He lied using God's name. He lied using Elisha's name to, uh, before Naaman. And now he lied to, Na- to, to Elisha. His master. We can run, but we cannot hide from God. You can lie to people. You can lie to your pastor. You can lie to your parents. You can lie to your kids. But you cannot lie to God. You can lie to yourself. What I mean can lie to ourselves is like this. When someone asks you, how are you? I'm good, but you're not good. That's lying to yourself. And God can reveal it to his servant and his prophets. So, remember this. The Spirit of God can reveal things that are hidden. Everything is crystal clear before the Lord. There's uh, sometimes, as I've been a pastor of this church, there are a few times that God revealed things to me in the dream about the situation of the church, of the people in the church. And I approach them one on one. And the reason why God revealed this, do you know why? Because God cares for you. Because sin cannot be covered, sin has to be uncovered. It's like a cancer, evil killing you, destroying your life. And God, if God reveals things, to me for the church because he loved the church. He wanted the church spotless, holy and pure and worthy. So, if you think you can lie, you cannot lie to God. Everything is open. Hebrew chapter 4, verse 12 to 13. Hebrew chapter 4, verse 12 to 13. For the word of God is alive and powerful. It is sharper than two sharpest two-edged sword. Now, listen to this carefully, okay? If someone says this, uh, the Bible, the word of God is, is sharp uh, as two-edged sword. It's wrong. Why? The Bible says sharper. Sharper. If you look at the book of Proverbs, the mouth of immoral woman Sharp as two-edged sword. But the word of God, sharper. Okay? So I, I want you to, to get this, even like small thing, but it's really different. In the book of Proverbs, the, the, the mouth of immoral woman, as sharp as two-edged sword. In the book of Hebrew, the word of God, sharper than this. Okay? So, so don't get mixed with that when, when, when someone's saying that. No, no, the word of God is sharper. Okay, sharper than the sharpest to edge of sword. Cutting between soul and spirit, between John and marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desire. Read this carefully, verse 13. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God. Everything is naked and exposed before His eyes, for He's the one whom we are accountable. Everything is open before the Lord. 
So Gehazi tried to make this lie, but Elisha said, I knew it. Because I saw it in the spirit, God revealed things to his prophets, to Elisha on Gehazi. Because what? Because God cares. Now I want to close with this. This is what happened to Gehazi after Gehazi lied to Elisha. This is very interesting. Second Kings chapter 5, verse 27. This is the last one, the last verse here. Second Kings verse 5, uh, chapter 5, verse 27. Because you have done this, you and your descendant will suffer from Naaman's leprosy forever. When Gehazi left the room, he was covered with leprosy, his skin as white as snow. Now, this is the message that I want you to remember. Okay? Consequences follow our every choice, even if we serve God. There's always consequences in this life. What you sow is what you reap. We cannot expect to be exempted from the consequences of our sin, even if we spend all that we are to serve the church. What you sow is you will reap. Be careful and be wise on what you sow. Because when we sow something, sometimes we don't think the consequences after that. We only see that moment, this is what I want, I want that money, I want that pleasure, but we don't know what next. Yeah. That's the consequence. And Gehazi didn't think of this. So if we sow good things, we reap good things. If we sow bad things, we reap bad things. Now, Gehazi, listen to this carefully, Gehazi was greedy on the material things that Naaman had. Gehazi Gehazi was greedy, was looking only this money, this wealth. But because of his greediness, not only the double gift he got from Naaman, but he also had the leprosy from what Naaman had. And not only that, sadly to say, not only Naaman got leprosy, but the Bible says, your descendants will have leprosy forever. Wow. Your kids, your grandkids, your great-great-grandkids, forever, they will suffer leprosy. Wow. Don't play around with this. Sin will take you further than what you want to go. Keep you longer than you want to stay. And cost you more than you want to pay. Be careful with that. Maybe we think only just small lying, Pastor. God, this is for the goodness of other people. Lying is lying. And there's a consequence there. So church, there's a lot of story we can learn from here. Don't play around with this. Because it's not only on us, but our descendant, our next generation will reap also. So if we sow good things, our descendant also will be blessed. Our kids, our grandkids. So I want to I wanna remind again from here. Guard your heart diligently. Okay? We can learn from this story. It's not about the title we have, we are Christian, how long we've been Christian, but it's about your heart. And I want to bring the church here to the next level. Let's move on. Be more like Christ every day. The character, the attitude, the mind that we have towards other people, towards ourselves. Don't let money become your master, but let God become your master. Amen? That's a message for today from Gehazi. God bless you. Let's pray. <clears throat> Let us stand together. <clears throat> I want every eyes closed here. And then I want you to examine and see yourself. 
Maybe some of you have been hiding something before the Lord and before your family, before your spouse, before your kids, before anyone else. Maybe this thing has been pulling you down. And you know that it is not right. This is not, not right. And you've been asking the Lord to help you to pull it out. But church, I'm telling you, God is able to pulling this out. If you let him to pull it out. So whatever it is, whatever in your mind, whatever in your heart that you've been struggling with, cast it out. Cast it out. For God cares for you. Maybe there's wrong thing that you've been doing and that maybe you did in the past. Ask God for his forgiveness. God is just and merciful. Confess before him that, Lord, I'm sorry for what I've done. I'm sorry for what I did. And that one needs to be cut off. Why? Because you don't want this curse. The consequences goes to your descendant, your next generation. You want to surrender everything before the Lord. And for those that you need prayer on this one, just put your hand on your chest and I will pray from here. You don't need to come here. Just stay on your place. Just put your hand on your chest. Whatever it is that's been pulling you down and struggling, then you've been struggling every day with this, just put your hand on your chest and I will pray for you. Whatever it is. Remember this. You know yourself. You know yourself. But many times we deny it. But before the Lord, everything is open. God, you see every hands right now. I pray for your mercy. We need your forgiveness. We need your help, Lord. For us to overcome this thing. We cannot do it ourselves. We have been trying this, but we cannot do it. We know it's wrong. But God, I pray that you help us by your strength, by your spirit. We can overcome this with you, Lord. I pray there will be new strength within them. There will be new insight that they can see beyond. That God is merciful. And together we agree we want to cut off the consequences, the curse of the sin that we did. Cut off in Jesus' name. And I pray from today's onward, the Spirit of the Lord will flow and lead and help to guard our hearts. Bless God. Bless your people. Let us raise both our hands together. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word. We receive this for our spirit, our life helping us to be more like you every day. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face forwards, towards you and give you peace. So church, go, arise and shine for the glory of the Lord is upon you. Fear not for God is with you. Don't look back, just look forward. There are so many great things that God has prepared for the church. And I pray, let your will be done upon our life. And be blessed, be blessed, and be blessed in Jesus' name. Everybody say, Amen. God bless you all. Have a great weekend. Thank you.